Welcome to those here in person and to those online. Um, I'm Dr Heather Strachan, uh, past chair of BCS Health and Care Scotland, and I'm delighted to have been asked to uh, help to organise uh, this year's Derek Hoy Memorial Lecture. Um, I just want to say a few words about Derek. Derek began his informatics career in the 1990s. He was an intensive care nurse and he really understood how technology could help nurses and patients. Um, he received a Florence Nightingale Foundation scholarship, which took him to the States. And he came back with much more in-depth knowledge about how digital transformation could improve the quality of patient care. Um, Derek worked nationally on many projects in the Scottish Government. He worked internationally um, as part of the European funded Nightingale project to create educational material for nurses across Europe. His work covered a huge area from initiatives such as the electronic health record, minimum data sets, standards, open source, areas that we are really rely on today as the foundation. Uh, for our digital NHS and care system. But that sounds a bit like a CV. I think what's really important uh, about Derek is that he was a leader. And we know that leadership is really crucial in terms of success for digital transformation. Derek had vision. He also had the ability to communicate that vision. He also networked. He also supported other people to develop their capabilities. So we really do celebrate Derek as a leader in this area. On the lighter side, he was an accomplished fiddle player and he enjoyed whiskey, which is hence the, uh, the venue today at the Scottish Malt Whiskey Society. But I would like to also introduce another leader in the field who is going to present this year's Derek Hoy Memorial Lecture. Andy Kinnear, welcome. Uh, Andy is a Chief Information Officer with an outstanding delivery record in leading major organisational and IT-enabled change programmes across his 23-year-old 23 year career. And he passionately believes in the transformation, transformation that information and technology can bring to the commissioning and delivery of healthcare services. And is in the enviable position of making this vision a reality. And he understands the broad range of technical and change skills needed to realize lasting benefits and has built a strong delivery team to ensure success uh, for customers. Andy supports the development of the NHS information informatics strategy and regularly presents at national informatics conferences. And Andy is going to talk to us about the digital NHS and really realising value. So thank you very much, Andy. Thank you, Heather. Well, I need to um, sack my scriptwriter. I think they're overselling my credentials there a little bit. So um, yes, hello, everybody. Really good to, to be here with the guys in the room. And hello to everybody who's uh, watching on the broadcast. As you'll find out in a minute, I'm back in my spiritual home. Um, I love coming back up to Scotland to, um, to, to talk to you folks and, and tell you a little bit about my, uh, my story and what's happening and, and in this instance how we realise value from, um, you know, from digital delivery. I just want to say up front, I, I never got a chance to meet um, Derek and ahead of uh, coming here to, to do this talk, I uh, went online and started to research and read a little bit about um, this guy and quite quickly realised I'd missed out on a on a major life treat in not meeting somebody who was so um, inspiring and so um, uh, such good fun to be around. And actually, not long after accepting the invite to come and do this um, lecture, I was in an interopen board meeting on a on a Zoom call, and Ian Ian McNichol um, happened to mention that the last uh, website domain he'd he'd acquired was actually left to him in a will. Um, now, this obviously prompted a little bit of interest across the group as they, um, you know, it's not a typical statement in the, in the interopen board. And he was forced to go on and explain the story. And during that story, he said, that's right. Um, you know, Derek Hoy had left him the Fresh Air uh, uh, website domain as part of that, um, part of that story. Because my ears pricked up at, at the mention of Derek's name and I got in touch with Ian and we shared a couple of calls with some great, you know, some great stories, including this one about the, 
the, that when Derek bought the iPad and decided it had got far better use as a, a tray for carrying whiskey rather than um, anything else. Anyway, I, you know, I really am, feel like I've missed out big time in not, um, in not having had the chance to, uh, you know, to meet him first hand. And honestly, uh, great to meet you, Christine and, and obviously Sarah uh, last night. Really, really nice to you know, meet you guys and celebrate you know, Derek's contribution to, um, to informatics. So a little bit about me, just by way, way of background. I, um, I spent about 30 years full time in the NHS, uh, originally 23 of those, as, um, as Heather has said, as a, as a CIO um, in various different seats. These days, I, um, I've got more hats than Ascot, um, to be absolutely honest. I do various roles with various people, but I suppose the, my, you know, my prime uh, role today in front of you guys is, is as working for um, the College of Health Information Management Executives, or CHIME. Um, who are an organisation uh, operating in about 50 countries, um, helping to drive up the calibre and quality of digital health leaders. And happily in the UK, we've been doing quite a lot of work with, uh, with the nurse leadership um, community. It was great to hear um, Derek Abinna, Florence Nightingale Foundation Scholar, because we've been working with um, scholars and literally, I'm just back from last week in the US taking 15 uh, British scholars out there to do exactly what you were talking about, Heather, and learn from you know, the best in the world at what they're doing. Um, I've got various other roles, I won't bore you with um, all of that, but fundamentally I am a Chief Information Officer. So I, this is how I would describe myself in the pub if somebody said, what do you do? That's what I do. I lead digital health and care um, you know, transformation programmes uh, as best as I can. Um, and that's what I you know, consider myself to, um, to be. And just to sort of re-emphasise my Scots credentials, so this is my uh, my nan, and more importantly, my granddad, um, who was born in in, uh, in Fife uh, back in the day, went on to play football in uh, Fife before the war. Decided to intervene on his um, on his football career, um, and ended up moving to my hometown in Crewe in Cheshire, uh, which is where my my nan was from, um, and moved there. Um, and the first question I should ask any of audience that ever, because this is the question he asked me every time I looked at this picture, is how is that hat staying on his head? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, that's, that's commitment to RAF uniform um, back in the war. But anyway, just like to sort of leave this out because I do genuinely feel at times that I'm, you know, back in the land of my father's or at least my grandfather um, when I come back up to uh, come back up to Scotland. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, realizing value really, and the basis of this um, this talk is is these two key elements, the two key elements that make up the value equation. So this relationship between quality, the quality of uh, what we deliver, the impact that that um, has on frontline care and ultimately on the, the patient um, experience versus the cost, the financial, emotional and time investment we make in, in delivering this thing, whatever this thing is, this digital project of some uh, form or other. Now, I'm going to start by talking to you about cost, and the good news is I'm not going to talk to you about it for very long, because that is the dullest part of this talk, I don't mind telling you. Um, I really want to spend uh, most of the time talking to you about how we uh, realise quality, and more importantly, how we understand the experience of our frontline um, clinical professionals when it comes to the digital landscape. So what are their lives like, and how are they improved through the... Um, through the delivery of, um, of digital you know, stuff, whatever that digital stuff might be. And actually, when I talk to um, audiences about cost, what I quite like to get into is to explain the true cost, because I've spent a lot of my career um, with, with executives and with boards who will quote prices at me as if that is the same as the cost. And so they will say, so-and-so bought this EPR system and they only paid five million for it. And they somehow lock in their brain that this whole thing is going to cost five million pounds. And it's almost like saying to yourself, I'm going to buy a car and it's only going to cost me 10,000 pounds. Well, it's not. It's going to cost you nearer 35 to 40,000 pounds in reality. The cost of the price of the car might be the 10,000, but by the time you put it on the road, insured it, fueled it and driven it for the, its life, you've probably paid at least three times that amount in all of that. And so the cost is much higher than the price. And, um, and actually, this is quite an important lesson. It's something that is quite often overlooked. It's certainly helpful to, to, to be able to explain business cases. Why is the number so big? Well, it's because the price is only part of the cost. 
Um, and so I use this uh, chart. I've not brought it with me this time, but I use this graph a lot because I used to have a, um, a laminated version of this, a printed out version of this picture. Well, I've still got it, it's just at home. A uh, printed out version of this picture that I would carry around with me everywhere I'd go. And every time I got challenged by a finance director or a whoever director, a chief exec, they say, well, why is it so expensive? I would pull this thing out and I'd say, I'm glad you've asked me. And I would use this to explain the true cost. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through this. I won't spend ages on it, but I'll walk you through this. The bottom line is, in the digital space, in the IT space, you can only spend your money on four things. In reality, there's four things you can actually invest in. Okay, the four blue boxes. Box one, running the operation. You spend money looking after the stuff you've already got. So your break fix teams, your engineering teams, your help desk, your whatever. The daily churn of just looking after the stuff that you've already deployed and you've already delivered. That's box one. It's unavoidable. That's cost of maintenance. Yeah, that's like putting fuel in the car or, you know, you know, that kind of thing. Box two, essential investments and renewals. So these are things you don't really have a choice over. So Microsoft are taking their, you know, their product stack end of life and you've got to upgrade onto the next set of operating system platforms and there's a license cost in doing that and there's a, a kind of staff cost in, you know, in upgrading and things like that. It's not really optional. It's essential. You've got to do it to keep the to keep the lights on. So it's over and above just day to day running, but nevertheless, it's not particularly value adding other than um, you know just keeping your own. It's, put, it's a, you know it's putting new tyres on your car. You want to put new tyres on it? Okay, you're road legal again. You can carry on driving, but you're not really ahead of where you were. You had a car yesterday. You've still got a car today. It's driving. It's the same sort of service. Essentially, it's in there. And so windows upgrades, things like that, go into that um, to that box too. Box three, digital development. I like to think of this more as the, uh, the moving off paper, moving onto you know, a digital platform of some form or other. Generally, it's not particularly revolutionary. It means you've moved from you know, an old fashioned you know, paper-based system to something digital, but largely you've not, you're not really transformed um, any, of the, you know, any of the service delivery and transformed the way in which health and care is delivered at, at that point. Um, you can see there I've got examples of, you know, EPR changes, upgrades, all, all of that kind of work that, again, is it might add a tiny bit of value, but essentially it's largely about um, just moving you to a place where you can then go on and do something, you know, more exciting with it. And then box four, and this is the one everybody gets excited about. So this is the shiny stuff. So this is all the, the new, you know, new things. Interesting, I know, I know I need to change this slide actually. I've thought about it the other day because I think shared records is probably sliding into box three now. This is not no longer new, you know, imaginative. Oh yeah, we've created a shared record across our patch. I think that's becoming more like a routine activity actually. And it's probably in three and in time will drop down, um, it drop down into two. But box four is the one that, you know, your non-exec on the board gets super excited about. They come bouncing in and they say, why aren't we running a AI program on, whatever i've seen it on you know i've seen it on the television or so you know whatever i've read about it or seen it in some sort of science journal things like that and they get super excited up there and it only costs this by which they mean the price is this and they do that and there's a relationship between these these four boxes you can see there's a sort of drift um down that scale to some extent most of the stuff that starts in box four ends up at least in box three and, and occasionally drops down um, to two through time, it goes through that that sort of cycle of um, of change. So you get a drift. But the reality is, the more stuff you do up here, requires more effort down there. Because every time you invest in a new system at the top of the chart, you've got new engineers or new support or new upgrades or new activity required further down on that um, you know on that price matrix. So if you're making a business case for a something in this space. Generally, I would advise including the costs that are going to be you know, captured down there, which is why the price is not the cost. It's a much bigger number when you're talking about it, because do you actually want this thing supported? Do you want it upgraded? Do you want it enhanced on the time? Do you want an engineer available when it goes wrong? So on and so forth is all of that cost. These things up here are really about taking you towards the future. You know, it's a future development you know, agenda. And that stuff at the bottom is really just, you know, stopping you going backwards. It's about maintaining, maintaining momentum. OK, so that's the kind of the end of the party political broadcast on cost, I guess. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the sort of advice I give to, you know, the audiences I speak to is, is firstly grasp that, understand that concept that I've described that the cost is bigger than that, and then think about your role in explaining that to others. So I feel I've spent, you know, 15 years or more taking execs through that picture and trying to coach them to a place where they understand the digital, uh, you know, the digital setup is, is more complicated and, and, and the costs therefore are more uh, sophisticated than um, they might be. And I mean, you know, seriously, I mean, I genuinely carried a laminated version around with me a lot. It was always in my case um, and it came out a lot. I even got to the point tragically where I would have a, a dry wipe marker so I could actually start writing the, pro you know, the actual project they were questioning me on. I would write the numbers next to each of those four boxes to explain why it was working out um, in that way. And I think that's been, um, that's been you know, real, a real asset for me in, uh, in my career. All right, so we've done cost. That's kind of boring, but over in some ways. Um, fairly important though, you don't really get many projects out of the ground unless you've got a, a budget in play. So um, uh, dull as it is, it's fairly, uh, fairly uh, vital for that part of the story. Oh. All my words have disappeared. Um, so the reason I was going to, let me see if the next one works. Yeah. So the, 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 the quality part of this conversation, in my mind at least, is, um, is how do we impact the patient in a positive way? So what we do in the digital space ought to, should always work towards some kind of positive impact for, uh, for the patient. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story now because I think it's quite a little interesting digression. But I, I went to work for uh, one of the national agencies briefly doing, um, doing some work. I was kind of in there a couple of days a week doing some uh, advisory stuff. And they said to me, can you go and uh, follow the breadcrumbs? Go and, go and speak to some people about their digital projects, understand what they're doing, and then eventually come back to, come back to our board with you know, your recommendations. And I went and had a conversation. These people, bear in mind these are working at national level in, in England. So, um, you know, they're up at the you know, kind of top of the shop or the top of the shop as they view it. And I had a conversation, it went like this. I would say, tell me about your project. And they would tell me about the project, whatever it was. I had, seriously, I had this 50 or 60 times, the same conversation. And I'd say, oh, that's interesting. You know, it might not be, but I'd pretend it was. Um, and I'd say, what, what are the drivers, right? And then they would say one of four, four things. And it, these, these would come in different order, but it didn't really matter. They would, they would say, so they'd say the first driver would be, well, it's a technology. It's about the technology because the technology's moved on. So we want to go from this old tech over here to this new tech over here. And that's, and that's what's really driving our project. And I'd say, I said, well, really? I said, what, you know, the tech's the actual drive, you know, at core of the driving. And they'd say, well, yeah, no, not really. I suppose, I suppose the main driver is contractual. I say, okay, what do you mean? And say, well, the contract with our vendor is running out, our supplier is running out over here. And so we're on this kind of burning platform contract situation and we've got to move over to a new contract over here. And I'd say, okay, well, I get that. Okay, so there's an imperative to do something because of the contractual position. But I said, that's not really a driver, is it? And they'd say, well, no, not technically, I suppose. The driver's financial because this contract costs us all this money over here and we need to save some money and, you know, uh, real, you know, uh, make it cheaper basically um, over this other side and I would say I'd say okay well I get there's a you know there's a financial cost savings you know element but I said is that really what's driving this project and they'd lean in normally this would always come last but they would lean in start to go in a slight quiet voice and they'd say no between you and me it's political like that it's what the minister wants or it's what somebody reports to the minister wants and normally by now, I'd, my face would be cracking. I'd be smiling, giggling a little bit and stuff like that. And, um, and they'd say, well, what's up? And I said, well, I've asked you four times what the driver is for your project. And you've not yet mentioned a patient, a doctor, a nurse, a GP, a sur a, a anything, a hospital, anything that is frontline care. And I would kind of point out to them that they worked for the NHS and actually the, the part of the reason they were struggling to get traction with their projects at a local level was because at a local level, that is where the story starts and ends. And if you're not starting with the, you know, the patient, the doctor, the nurse, then you're frankly not doing your job, your job properly. And I think one of the, the greatest privileges in my um, 30 years in the NHS has been to, I guess, witness the rise of the, the um, clinical voice in the digital space and I think you know Derek was a real pioneer of, of his kind actually I think we've seen people tiptoe into it in the 90s 
I think in the in the first decade of you know this century, I think we've seen more of it. I think in the last ten years, it's gone off the scale, and you simply cannot get a digital project out of the ground successfully in the NHS now without you know it being genuinely clinically led and the clinical teams being part of that. And there are heaps of um, you know digital nurse leaders emerging to you know drive and take that course, course for, forward. And so I kind of wanted to concentrate a little bit on the the realising value being to listen to those people and actually make a difference for um, clinicians and how we might um, do all of that. And I think I've, I come up with this picture um, a while ago and I think, it, 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 you know, I haven't got tons of evidence behind it. I can't actually, you know, say I've written it up, but I can just witness it time and time again. The organisations that are successfully delivering digital transformation projects in, in health and care have these three elements. Um, wrapped around the, you know, wrapped around them. They have, uh, they have a good CIO with a decent, you know, architecture team and so on and so forth. A good IT department that knows how to um, deliver stuff. Um, critically, they have clinical leaders, you know, good CCIO, CNIOs, those kind of characters that are genuinely driving that. And then at some level or other, they have a board that are in this space. And when I talk to nursing audiences, I often say, you know, your career is going to take you in one of two directions, you'll, you'll either end up in a CNIO seat or you'll end up as a chief nurse officer in, you know, in, a, in an NHS organisation. Either way, I've got you because your responsibility is going to be to deliver some digital transformation because that's the, that's the reality of it. The organisations that are doing it, uh, excuse me, successfully are doing it with those three, those three groups in place. And actually the tragedy is when you witness an organisation that's only got one or two of those and good people are not able to make the headway that they, they ought to be able to make because those um, elements don't exist. So I want to talk to you about um, the clinical digital experience, the experience of frontline you know, doctors, well in this case mostly nurses, but frontline uh, doctors and nurses of their digital landscape and in particular of their electronic patient record, right? So for, the, for, for a while I think we've had a lot of um, received wisdom about what that experience was. So people will pronounce to me, uh, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, they will pronounce a, um, what's wrong is this? Or I can tell you what the nurses are thinking, they're thinking this. And it's a sort of, it's delivered with such confidence that you almost daren't challenge it. But in reality, it's just one person's opinion. It's just one you know, whoever they might be, doctor, nurse, whatever, um, you know, presenting you with, a, with an opinion. And I think what's interesting about this piece of work that um, I'm going to describe in a second is that this is getting into actual measurement, actual empirical data of what that frontline experience actually is, looks like, feels like, um, and it's happening. And it's a piece of work that's um, it's been developed by a company called Class uh, Research, KLAS, uh, named after their founders, Kent, Lenny, Adam and Scott. Uh, set up that company um, in the early 1980s, essentially to research um, experience of digital solutions in and around um, healthcare. They've been uh, an amazing company, actually, really, really interesting and great guys uh, based out of Utah in uh, the United States. The Arch Collaborative, that arch is a stone arch in, in the Bryce uh, Canyon in, in Utah, which is why they've done that. And the Arch Collaborative is an initiative running across, um, running across the world, actually, I'll explain in a, bit, in a moment. Uh, what do class do? Well, they focus first on the clinician. They're absolutely front and centre interested in uh, the clinician, uh, not the technology. They want to know what the experience of those doctors and nurses is. They want to know through measurement what that experience is like. So not just anecdotal you know, noise. They, they're really interested in getting into uh, measurement. They're, 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 they're determined that um, some are doing it better than others. And so therefore there's an opportunity to learn from those organizations that are being um, successful in this space. Uh, they can you know, focus on improvements that you can make at relatively low cost. So lots of this, as you'll see, as I describe it, is about changes in behavior and habit and things like that. It's not, it's not massive, you know, billion pound business cases at all. Um, and you know, if organizations know how to fix the problem, then they've got a fighting chance of doing it. And of course it focuses ultimately on uh, the fact that you know happy clinicians equals digital success. You know if you can if you can satisfy that frontline user, then you've got yourself um, a good place. Let me click on. So the Arch Collaborative is this. So 300 
um, organisations around the world. And just for clarity, 300, they count the NHS as one in that, to give you a measure of, so some of these are big health systems or big health groups, they count the Mayo Clinic as one, despite the fact it running, you know, 28 hospitals or whatever it runs. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot in there. Uh, that number, 300,000, that's about six months out of date, so I suspect that's probably closer to 400,000, if not higher these days. It's running in about 12 countries. Um, just a simple survey, relatively simple survey, uh, maximum 33 questions. I think the version um, we've done here is shorter than that, but about seven minutes to fill in. And after the back of that, I've created loads and loads of evidence-based, uh, you know, so research outputs, best practice guides, you know, this is what good, you know, good guys are doing, or you know, people who've made progress, so on and so forth. And they run a couple of summits, uh, one in the US in Utah, and then one in Portugal each year, basically taking all of their learning and teaching and you know, taking it to a wider audience and encouraging um, other people to, um, to get involved. Okay, so when I do talks, I say all, you know, all slides are created equal but some slides are, created, are more equal than others, you know, a bit like the Animal Farm um, quote, and this is one of these. So I think this, this, um, this is really like one of the key messages in um, what I'm going to talk about today. So this graph is showing you uh, every one of those blue lines is a different organisation that has responded to uh, the Class Art Collaborative Service. So this is a little bit, you know, behind the curve, but it's 203 um, organisations that have responded to the Art Collaborative uh, thing and when they say providers the percentage pro they mean provide provider in that sense means frontline healthcare worker doctor nurse uh, HP whatever it might be and so what that's saying is that the percentage scale along the bottom is the percentage of doctors nurses HPs and so on in that organization that are satisfied with their digital experience predominantly of their EPR so they are satisfied with their electronic patient record so you can see Top of this chart, what they run in about, I don't know, 90 odd percent, 95 percent, maybe something like that. There's an organisation up there, 95 percent of the clinicians in that organisation are happy with their EPR. I mean, where is that place? How is this? I'm going to tell you in a minute where it is, but how, how, how is that even possible? That feels a million miles away from where we are um, health service wise. Meanwhile, down here, uh, you know, uh, bottom left there, uh, what, 10 percent, 8, 10 percent, something like that are satisfied. Um, you know, complete disaster. You know, 10% of your organisation are happy. You've, you've, you've invested and deployed an EPR and one in 10 clinicians is happy with that. Man, I'd be resigning on the spot if that was my organisation. I think that's just so depressing. Now, the killing bit of this, uh, this slide, the really interesting bit um, is, when you, uh, is when you do this. Because what those coloured lines are doing is they are joining organizations the top and bottom organization that have got the same epr product okay so that green line is our system same system down here that is the range in which that epr exists blue what fourth fifth at the top there something like that all the way down to rock bottom you imagine me that vendor looking at that you're, 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 a, you're an EPR supplier and you get that chart and realise that you've, you've delivered to two customers, one that's achieved 90% satisfaction, one that's achieved less than 10% satisfaction with the same product. I mean, what is going on? <laughs> you know, I'll come on to what's going on, but seriously, what is going on? It's, it's an absolutely staggering uh, picture. And of course, what you're really interested in um, doing what we're really interested in doing, and what class are really interested in helping with, is is you know what's going on, what what is going on there, what's the difference between those organisations that are top of that chart um, and achieving you know big numbers versus um, those that don't. What's interesting in uh, in here that that little blocked out bit at the bottom that's not it's not the top rather that's not come across basically says, and the good news is that this has come to uh, the UK. In fact, at the moment it's come to England only. Um, we're in the process of talking to Wales about doing it there and hopefully uh, sometime in the future about bringing it to Scotland as well. But um, this, this Arch Collaborative has been rolled out across England in uh, over the last uh, year or so in last autumn to community mental health and ambulance uh, trust organisations, uh, to uh, acutes earlier this year and hopefully to primary care um, sometime in the, in the next, um, well, in the next few months um, to go on and do that. And it's shown some really interesting things. So... Um, this is the results in England for 
uh, community mental health and ambulance, you know, a plus six, I don't know if people know like net promoter scores, how net promoters work, but you, you take the kind of best away from the worst. You can have a range that goes from a minus 100 all the way up to plus 100. Usually you're aiming for something in the plus 60s is, you know, is like, you know, pretty, pretty darn good. Um, so for them, uh, they are plus uh, six, pretty, well, pretty poor really um, in reality and perhaps not a, a complete surprise that they're um, in that place. Allegedly 41% um, are pleased, most in mental health by way. Um, you'll see in a, a second there's, the others aren't doing so, so great, lots of frustrated. Um, the acutes, uh, even more depressing, that should be minus one actually, sorry, in that blue box. Yeah, there's a minus one um, in there, so lock, stock and barrel, you know, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty depressing place really. Um, so, so many uh, folks not um, very pleased. When you lay those numbers onto the um, March Collaborative, so these are the, the blocks for uh, for England, oh, sorry, it was community, not mental health, that were doing quite well. That's the entire Arch Collaborative globally, shown on that funnel chart. And then these blocks here are the, um, are the positions for uh, the UK. You can see you wouldn't want to be in an ambulance trust um, just now. That's, the, you know, that's a fairly um, depressing place. Now, I think there's a slight note of qualification needed on this graph, because if you stop for a second and imagine who are the organisations globally that will join the Arch Collaborative, I think by definition they're probably the most progressive and they're probably naturally interested in, you know, introspective and interested in their own uh, results. I suspect if you were to take a, you know, an entire, you know, picture across the world, it would, it, the UK position wouldn't look perhaps so, quite so depressing. Um, it's, it's sort of falsely deflated, I think, by the fact that some um, organisations are, um, you know, are, are kind of interested in their own performance and therefore have had years to improve their performance off the back of this um, as a result. But nevertheless, these are not results to be like, you know, shouting from the rooftops about. I think, um, you know, England is, is rightfully fairly depressed about that. And you can see this variation is, um, is really sort of, you know, quite upsetting and quite confusing in a way. So again, in England, the top five trusts, top five hospital, uh, this is just acute, it's the top five, you know, net promoter score, I'll put there at 47.5, that's pretty good, actually. That's not bad. You know, that's, you, you, you take that, it's, it's, so you can see it's in the, in the middle of the matrix for the, um, uh, for the Arch Collaborative as a whole. Bottom five, you know, how are they even getting out of bed in the morning? I don't know, it feels really depressed uh, place to be. And, they're, you know, they're absolutely sort of struggling with those results. And again, when you overlay the suppliers, I think you get an equally interesting picture. So there's a couple of questions in my mind about, you know, who are these guys down here? So even their best results are not particularly, especially that um, orange one, you know, even their best results are pretty shocking. Um, but nevertheless, it's not that different to the Arch Collaborative as a whole. That's, again, is, uh, I think that's just mental health, yeah, it is mental health community and um, ambulance. But you can see such a, you know, huge variation in, in performance across those, um, you know, across those organisations that are sitting there. And same in acute. Um, again, you know, we've got at least one vendor that's probably not going to make the, you know, you know make the long-term journey. Um, but most of the others are, are in a fairly broad range across, you know, satisfaction and, um, you know, and performance, really. And I think this is, you know, if you're sitting in a vendor's shoes, I think this is a really confusing message to be getting. You know, you'll be delivering projects and taking organisations live and probably thinking you're doing all right. And, and, and in reality, I've probably done a decent product. You know, if somebody can get to these levels of satisfaction, your product's probably okay, is, is the truth of it. Um, it's not too far. The, the question is, what is, um, you know, what's going on behind the scenes here? And I think this is where it gets really interesting. This is going to spend a few minutes just talking through some of this. So, so the assessment, the, the sort of class research, suggests only about a third of the variation relates to the product. In fact, in England, that number is about 24%. So this 33% this that relates to, um, you know, that relates to the vendor and the product itself is around about a quarter um, in the English study that we've seen. So the only way you can explain that variation, a quarter of it can be explained by, um, by product. Even that's not entirely fair, because sometimes that's about have you taken all the modules or not type thing. But nevertheless, it's about the, the, the product that's in place. By far and away, the bigger explanations, combined explanations, are the organisation and the individual themselves. Um, 
which again I think is partly an organisation responsibility to grow that individual. But you'll see what I, what I mean. There's three factors that really determine, um, you know, determine success. Um, and this, this is the kind of payoff. This, is the, this explains that initial graph. Why is the variation so high? It's, it, it basically boils down to these three things. Firstly, personalization. The ability for a user to create the product in a way that works for them. The ability for them to alter the screen, adjust the layout, make it work for their clinic or their service or their, um, you know, their waiting list, whatever it is. The fact that they can personalize the look and feel of the product to work in the way their mind works or to work in the way their, um, you know, their flow, their patient flow through their service works is, is one of the three big factors that play out in this. And the, and the systems that allow and the organisations, more importantly, and the IT departments that buy into the concept of a product looking different on different screens and not being, you know, being able to cope with the idea that they're sending engineers to fix things that look different rather than having that rigid lockdown mentality that we've you know, often seen in IT. Um, the organisations that can cope with that level of personalisation are seeing far higher satisfaction rates. Um, that's point one. Point two, shared ownership. So this means hand in glove operation between clinical teams and IT teams. Essentially means clinicians who don't feel done to, they feel part of the story. In fact, they are helping design the next stages of the product development. They are working on what they want and they are seeing it enacted in the product they are using. And so this isn't a kind of, um, you know, it just land, they'd land in one Monday and all of a sudden they've got a different looking product. It's just been done to them. Nobody told me the clinic lists were changing. You know, that kind of story that you hear, that deep frustration. Your jobs are hard enough as it is without suddenly turning up and finding the IT setup has been reconfigured without speaking to you. Um, the reality is that story is very, very, you know, a joint one. Um, and you'll see in a minute, I've got a couple of examples of organisations that are doing that um, really well. And then the third one, and I think this is... Um, in, in many ways, this is the most unforgivable, actually, that we, that we, that we allow this to happen, is, um, is expertise. They call this EPR mastery, the ability of the individual user to, to be expert in the product that they have been given. I have witnessed, I mean, in fact, I've even been involved in EPR deployment projects where we have sent a clinician for their EPR training six to eight weeks before they're gonna sit down and use that product in, in real life. They're gonna have four hours of classroom training, four hours, and then they're gonna adopt this thing eight weeks later and they're gonna be expected to use it daily, constantly, I think. And we wonder why they're frustrated and not getting the best value out of it and things like that. I mean, you, can you seriously imagine being given, I don't know, a four hour intensive driving course and then eight weeks later turning up to take your driving test? Uh, or, or anything. There's just simply no way that you, you human beings can absorb knowledge, retain it for that length of time, and then um, you know hope to be expert users in in what they have. And very often you, we might supplement it with a few you know floor walkers or a super user here or there and stuff like that. But we don't actually recognise the fact that learning is a constant you know development cycle. And to develop genuine EPR or, or electronic health record. Uh, EHR mastery, then that is a that is an activity that needs to be you know continuous, uh, frankly, and we need to you know support that um, in what we do. And so, um, just talk about a few organisations that have done this. Is King Faisal Hospital in um, in the UAE in the Middle East? Um, they've achieved ninety first percent off, and that uh, you know so they're one of those ones in that ninety percent uh, blue bar uh, across the top. Uh, massive improvement between 2018 and 2020, 14 point leap. I mean, that's significant, really is quite significant. Well, it's third highest change I think class I've ever seen between two um, surveys, the top performing Cerner organization in the whole world. Um, so you now can work out which one of those colored bars was um, Cerner um, from that piece. Um, and the details they've got, chief exec is completely bought in. It goes back to my triangle piece. So, you know, they've got very, very top of the shop um, support. Informatics has got um, loads of clinicians, loads more than you can possibly imagine. I'll come on to an example in a minute. You will be blown away by the numbers of clinicians working in the um, in the in the digital um, 
team. And the other bit that they've done, I think, that's really clever, and it goes to this personalization piece, is they've stood up departmental level uh, champions, but those champions have got a role of coordinating the personalization that goes on. So the, the, the way this system is configured is very different as you go from, I don't know, nephrology to, you know, urology or wherever you might go. It, it looks and feels and is, is designed in a very different way, but specific to that um, clinical group. I think it's an amazing, uh, you know, amazing organization, really interesting. And interesting, you sort of, you can look at that and say, well, they've got loads of money. You know, surely in the Middle East, they've got loads of money. The, the, these activities that they've undertaken, this isn't financial stuff. This is just, it's just clever. It's just activity. It's behavior um, is, what they've, um, is what they've gone on and done. Um, this one is, uh, is Melbourne, I think. Uh, I can't remember. Yeah, Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, 97th percentile. I mean, heck, you know, it's all about top of the league. This is a, um, I was going to say it's Man City, but it's probably Celtic up here, is it? I think it's, 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 it's <laughs> controversial. Um, but it's, you know, this is absolutely top draw quality, you know, achievement that um, uh, they're getting. You know, real, you know, massive focus on um, changes for uh, clinicians. You know, really, really sort of um, superb. And you'll see in a second, I'll talk about another example in um, in Australia, uh, Melbourne. But we're doing some good stuff here. So this is, uh, this is Morecambe Bay. Morecambe Bay, between their first survey in 2016 um, and their second survey in 2019, I think those years might be quite right, actually, it might be more like 2017 and 2020, but um, they had a 15 point improvement from, from one to two. So um, that's the second biggest class I've seen anywhere in the world. So from their first survey, um, they were really down in the doldrums. They got quite low scores, um, very frustrated. I remember speaking to Andy Wicks there uh, CIO and he was you know he's just mortified when they got the first results he you know he genuinely thought we were doing a good job and then we got these scores through and realized our clinicians were you know deeply unhappy um, but they dusted themselves down and they went on a, a you know kind of major improvement cycle loads of activity that that was relatively simple they you know improved their service desk they sent out their engineers on on you know problem solving you know fact finding thing just go and mend everything that's wrong you know, when you go out to mend a thing, just check with the, you know, is your printer working okay, is your whatever it is, just, just improve the, the experience of people, uh, whatever it might be. Um, they, they appointed a, a really good uh, CI, CCI, clinical CIO, uh, Colin Brown, and he worked really closely with the IT department to bring that shared ownership piece together. So the changes they started to make, the doctors and nurses saw come in. You know, it was, it was all behavioral stuff. It wasn't particularly expensive. Um, to do to do lots of this stuff, it was much more about um, you know this uh, sort of um, uh, continuing improvement. I love that bottom bullet point: the low friction way of reporting problems. You know, the old method had been, uh, sorry, I can't mend that. If you ring the help desk and, and get another ticket, we'll send an engineer back to do it. The low friction way of mending it is, what is it? Let me mend it while I'm here. And so that's what they did. They just changed the way in which they did IT break fix, and immediately people are happy. You know, you're not delaying, you're not giving somebody else a problem to ring a service desk and, you know, wait on a call for eight minutes to speak to a human or whatever. You're, you're just fixing the problem right in front of you. It's so simple, some of this um, stuff. And then just to spend a few minutes, I don't know how I'm doing for time, actually. How much longer have I got? I'm sort of gabbling away. I've got plenty-ish. Um, I've got some. Um, so I'll talk to you about um, Aaron Jones, because I think this guy is really, really the sort of, you know, the, the absolute sort of spectacular... Uh, nursing leader. He's the chief um, uh, nursing midwifery officer at uh, Sydney local health district in um, in Australia, and um, he's really compelling. What's interesting for me is um, I spent uh, I went to have dinner with um, with Aaron in 2017, and he told me this story of what he was going to do, um, and I sat there politely and nodded um, and listened to him, but with that slight air of yeah okay sure tell me when you've done it and then i got to see him present these slides in portugal this uh, in march um and i thought i was having a deja vu moment except everything was now in the past tense because mostly of what he said he was going to do um he had done so he um firstly they rebranded their it department they don't use the phrase it um, at all they talk about digital health um and they got uh, nurses to outwardly talk as in digital nurses to outwardly talk about um, the role of um, IT. He um, went on this humanizing the IT department. They did this big campaign of 
introducing the people. So these were no longer stuck in the basement, you know, the flat food crowd where the, you know, the pizzas were slid under the door because it's too dangerous to go in there. Um, none of that. They were not allowed to be that. They were out, outwardly speaking and visible to the rest of um, the organisation, as you see Katrina. Uh, yeah, been doing that. They did. I've, I've included quite a lot of detail here, mainly because if you get the slides and you can take them away and you can read afterwards. So this is this is all um, Aaron's content. But lots and lots of work um, with coaches working with clinical MDT teams to work out the best way to optimise the product, to um, set the screens up, to um, personalise uh, the thing in, and critically to keep the training continuous. So this isn't four hours, eight hours before, eight, eight weeks before you go live. This is a continuous cycle of, um, of coaching, improvement, training, uh, you know, little online apps that pop up in the system to support you on the way to do things. You name it, they are doing it. Um, you know, brown bag lunches, you know, once a week, you know, everybody gathers in, in reception, gets given 50, free lunch for 15 minutes worth of, you know, something, you know, showing how to do a referral or whatever it might be, some sort of coaching thing. Um, they do that. They're into um, expanding their teams, creating this, uh, you know, this digital uh, footprint. There's a number on here somewhere. Oh, this is what they did. Oh, this is fascinating, right? So he asked his nurses, his digital nurse leaders and his, his digital nurses, did they know what ITIL is? Know you guys know what ITIL is, but IT is the, ITIL is the uh, Information Technology Infrastructure Library. This is, the, this is the guidebook to a CIO. How do you run an IT department? You get the ITIL manual and you follow it. It is the global standard for running, um, you know, running a technology um, department. And he said, well, how, how can nurses and be part of the digital family if they don't understand the complexity in running the IT part of this thing? So he sent all of his nurses to go and learn ITIL. This is like ITIL level one. How do you manage incidents? How do you manage change within a, an IT um, architecture, how do you, you know, how, the problems, how do you track the assets, how do you even know where the devices are and things like this. This is relatively basic stuff for, you know, most of those IT departments, but he wanted his nurse teams to have an appreciation of the complexity that IT were dealing with behind the scenes to keep all of this stuff going and to deal with all these things. So when they ask for tickets, why are they doing that? Because that's how you manage incidents, that's how you track you know, well, why would you have service level, you know, uh, service test level ones, level twos and so on? Well, that's because that's good practice and stuff. So he taught his nurses basics. Not, I mean, this is one day course. This is not years of training to go in. But to do level, level one, he wanted the nurses to be able to um, understand and do all of that. And then the last thing he did is he argued and argued and argued for more clinicians to be part of the digital setup. And this number is crazy in my view it's absolutely incredible he's got four clinicians in working in the digital health team in sydney for every thousand frontline uh staff they've got eight thousand people working for their organization he's got 42 clinicians as part of the digital setup not all full-time uh, and not all nurses by the way you know across across a range of disciplines but nevertheless talk about hand in glove i mean that is hands in gloves I mean, that's, that's a you know, really hefty investment in the digital people to create that kind of shared ownership paradigm that I talked about. Nothing happens on their IT systems. Nothing happens in their EPR without nurses and clinicians being involved and being aware of it and frankly creating it um, in the first place. Incredibly impressive story, what's gone on in Sydney and I think one in which we'll, um, we'll see a bit more. So that's me talking through the value equation. I just wanted to share this one slide with you because I think one of the things that class are starting to do that's quite interesting is they're beginning to get into measuring the patient experience beyond just the clinician experience. So this is, these are numbers just from, these are the results, sorry, just from some work they've done in the US. I think about, I can't remember the number there, yeah, you can see. Um, so only just shy of 9,000 patients. So not a massive, massive, massive survey. But I think this is really fascinating because they were asking patients what were the things that they would value? What are the elements of a, of a clinical digital experience that they would value? And then they started to plot um, the provider ad ad adoption, so the degree to which hospitals in the US are adopting that thing, whatever the thing that they were being asked for, and probably more importantly, the degree to which the vendor was actually creating product that did that thing. And I think some of these are, um, you know, absolutely fascinating. So request to fill in prescriptions, refills on prescriptions, you know, repeat prescriptions essentially is what that's saying. Patients absolutely demanding it, vendors nowhere near it, 
not even on their priority list. Meanwhile, you come down here, patient satisfaction survey, yeah, because we all love filling those in, don't we? Patients absolutely adore doing that. Nobody wants a patient satisfaction survey. Vendors can't give you enough of them. They're obsessed with creating. And I think this is interesting. Uh, this, this works in its very early stages, but I think as this work plays out and we start to see much bigger numbers, much more detail and much more research, I think we're going to see um, some quite interesting stuff. And if you bear in mind, class, the way it mostly makes its money is by selling the results of these surveys to the vendor community. Um, you know, I think if I was one of those vendors getting that, I'd be saying, what's going on? What are we doing? We're not even speaking to our, you know, our frontline users here. We don't understand. We're totally prioritising the wrong things um, compared to, to what they're doing. So this, I just want to wrap up with um, these few words because this is a slide I got asked to put together um, in 2018 to celebrate the NHS's uh, 70th birthday. And I was asked to do a five minute slot at the beginning of a, a conference in London. And they said, can you come up and just talk a bit about the impact digital has had um, on, um, on healthcare, um, you, know, tr you know, something about the IT and all of this. And I started with a picture of one of those ridiculous valve computers from the 60s and, you know, two guys wheeling it in with, a, you know, like massive suitcases or whatever to try and move this thing, the site, you know, that now we can do on a calculator. Um, and I thought, actually, that's so boring. IT is really, really dull. In reality, my entire career has actually been about trying to do things that ultimately help the people that we are serving. So the, the, you know, our care professionals, our doctors and nurses, our patients and our public, the entire story has to be about making digital impactful for, um, you know, for frontline care, re re recognising your responsibility to the public to you know, spend their money wisely, um, but ultimately to deliver, um, you know, to deliver uh, good things for the patients. And I think um, that's why, um, you know, people like Derek have been, you know, really inspirational because that's, that's his agenda. You know, his agenda all along was how do we improve uh, patient care through the, through the, um, you know, the digital store. And I found this quote looking out loud, I just, I, it blew me away. What, a, what an incredible man. And, um, you know, thank you for allowing me to come here and celebrate, you know, his life and his contribution and share a bit of my contribution along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For a fantastic presentation, and we really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Sean Levy. I'm the treasurer of BCS Health and Care Scotland. I'm also uh, part of Edinburgh University, and I wonder if you can just give us your thoughts about involving students in this development. I feel that we teach and we support our learners mm. um, to, to work in a 20th century kind of health <laughs> and social care service and, and we don't put enough emphasis on the digital transformation in the very um, first building blocks. What, what's, what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, well, my first thought is maybe next time I come to Scotland I'll do the talk about the generations and the challenges that we've got on the generation because I do think you're, you're exactly right. I think we've got this bizarre situation where we've got baby boomers like me leading digital conversations for, gener you know, for, for Gen Y and Gen Z and you know, the, 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 these kind of young kids who've never not known a world without the internet and have never not known digital, but have never, you know, have lived through smartphone technology all of, their, you know, all of their sort of conscious life, if you like. And I think um, we're in a really dangerous place because I think we've got you know, some old thinking uh, and, the, you know, these guys must look at it and just think we're, you know, completely crazy. We're so, we're so out of touch and, and, and distant from um, that element of it. I think that's, for the, you know, problem one is recognising that, that that cohort are our future. And actually, many, very often know more about some of this stuff than, you know, we've done. They're so, you know, in, endemic in them. So that's point one, I think. Point two is that... Um, I've often got frustrated at the way clinical training and clinical, you know, uh, training is delivered because I often think it's, it has managed to sort of detach itself from the digital narrative a bit too much, actually. You know, I can remember talking to, uh, you know, nurse trainers and things like that a long time ago, actually, about, you know, why aren't you teaching, you know, good EPR practice? Why aren't you teaching consistent, um, you know, information coding, um, you know, as part of your teaching? This stuff is really, really important. and. Um, I think so. I think we've had a slightly old-fashioned and resistant, uh, you know, view from some, from some, you know, some in that quarter as well. And I think that's been a problem. Um, but I think the key thing is, I mean, these people are our future. You know, they absolutely are our future. And 
you know, I, 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 I'm massively in favour of you know, getting to people as early as you possibly can in a good way. And actually, um, interestingly, you know, I mentioned we were out in the US last week. We had a couple of nurses there that were early 20s, mid 20s, something like that. And they are unbelievable breath of fresh air. The kind of questions they ask are not the kind of questions, you know, my generation ask um, in a good way. You know, and I think they've just got such a unique insight on this thing that this isn't, a, this isn't about somebody training somebody, you know, some, somebody older training somebody younger. I don't think it's that agenda anymore. I think this is a two-way dialogue, you know, where you get in a bit of a, well, have you thought about doing it this way? Have you thought about doing it that way? Um, and I think, you know, unless we embrace those, those folks and make them feel part of that conversation, we're going to lose them to other sectors because other sectors are doing this. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the genuine challenge. I mean, I won't go on about it too much, but you know, I do another talk called The War on Talent and that genuinely is we, we, we're running out of young people and healthcare needs to fight its corner to get its fair share of, you know, of people in this space. Um, and I think you know, at the moment we can block them through, through just not making this stuff interesting or accessible to them. There's no other question. I think we're really pushing for time. Is there anything? So again, I wanted to thank you, Andy, for coming all the way up to Scotland to give us your insightful presentation here um, this afternoon. And thank you for those who um, especially came to, to um, join us here at the, the venue and those who looked at us um, through the internet. And uh, we look forward to our next year and the year after and how we celebrate this um, the, the, the vision of, of leadership and innovation and, and exciting uh, digital space. Thank you again. Cheers.